Does. And so that's why everyone, we are not uh, tabula rasa. People say when you're born, we're all like a blank slate and you can write anything on it. Not a fact. Everyone's coming with the same problems and hang-ups and attachments from the last life. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, anyone, and some of my friends, they have twins. And so the twins are born on the same day, from the same mother, in the same place. And immediately, when they're just a few months old, it's obvious that they're two completely different persons. Mm -hmm. Why? Because everyone's coming with their samskars. Samskar means impressions of activities of the past life in the subconscious mind. Now, in Vedanta, the psychological body, which is called the Chitta in the Yoga Sutras, it's divided into four parts. That is Manas, Buddhi, Ahankar, and Chitta. Four parts. So, Manas is your conscious mind. And with your conscious mind, you're making decisions. I like this, I don't like that. You take up something, accept something, and after some time reject it. This is the function of the mind. We think that we're making choices, but this acceptance and rejection is actually based on impressions of previous experience. So it's just our choices are really like the echoes of our past karma. And that's how our past karma is controlling our present activities. So the chain of karma goes on, all the links connected. So, then above the mind you have buddhi, intelligence. So buddhi functions, it helps us identify objects. And it also controls our different states of consciousness. So three functions of buddhi are swap, jagrat, swapta, sushupting cha, guna to buddhi brittayaha. When the buddhi becomes more sattvic, you wake up. When it becomes more rajasic, you go to sleep and dream. And when it becomes more tamasic, then you go into deep sleep. So by the fluctuations of a buddhi, you're experiencing these waking, dreaming and deep sleep states, going backwards and forwards. So this is buddhi. So the function of buddhi also includes memory, smriti, imagination, and, as we mentioned, identifying objects. Now, after that, you have Ahankar. So the Ahankar, we've gone from the conscious mind, now we're going to the subconscious mind. Ahankar means ego. And then, the last portion of the subtle body is called Chitta. So Chitta is fine very very fine it's the first of all material elements when the universe is created then there's only unmanifest energy and the first energy that comes out from this is called Mahatattva and it's bright it's sattvic it's very light it's luminous it's expansive so the portion of that Mahatattva which is in your psychological body is called Chitta so when the Mahatattva is in your psychological body, that's called Chitta. So it's very light. But the problem is this. The objects of the physical world, they're tamasic. So every time you touch them, taste them, smell them, and try to enjoy them, then that leaves impressions in the Chitta of the tamas, of the mode of darkness, the mode of ignorance. And so the more impressions are there in the chitta of the sense gratification, it starts to go dark. So chitta by nature is luminous and expansive, but it starts to go dark and it starts to contract. And when it gets very dark, and you can't practically see it anymore, then that dense mass, that dense mass of impressions of sense gratification in the material world over many, many lifetimes, that is called ahankar, ego. And that is present in the subconscious mind. And it makes us think, well, I am this body. I am 20 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, 80 years old. I'm going here and there. I'm standing, sitting, walking, opening, closing my eyes. Krishna says, naivam kinchit karomiti 
one whose consciousness is pure, whether he is standing, sitting, walking, talking, opening or closing his eyes, he knows that his senses are engaged with the external objects, but the self is doing nothing. Atma, the self, not doing anything. But we think we're doing so many things. Like a child who spins around and around and falls over, and then they look, they see all the trees are going around. The trees are still, but they think the trees are moving. So in the same way, due to ahankara, we think ahankara, I am doing. Ahankara, the word ego in such means I am doing. So, this is our uh, condition. So what is necessary is, if we can clean out all those sanskars, impressions in the subconscious mind, in the chitta, then that ego, that knot of ego that ties us to the physical realm will dissolve and you will be transcendental. Actually, soul is always transcendental, but we can realize that we are divine beings, that we are part and parcel of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this is what chanting the holy names does. First thing, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Chaito Darpana Marjana. So, originally, there is only Chitta. And when it becomes contaminated by Tamagun, it becomes Ahankar. And then a portion of that becomes Buddhi, and a portion becomes Manas. So, your mind, intelligence, ego, these are just all evolutes of the pure uh, psychological substance, the Chitta. Just like if you have milk, and you can make it into yogurt, then you can churn the yogurt and make it into butter, then you can heat the butter and make it into ghee, like this. So, the, it's only milk, but it goes through four stages. So, similarly, your subtle body, psychological body, is one thing, Chitta. But it goes through four stages of contamination and becomes your ego and uh, buddhi, intelligence and mind. So, in this way we become under the control of our past impressions completely. You see, how does a buddhi work, your memory? Hmm? It works like this. Let's say you see something, you see a cow. So then, that impression of the cow comes into your conscious mind. That's called pratyai, con an impression that's happening right now in the conscious mind. So then your buddhi is the interface between the conscious mind and the subconscious chitta. So the buddhi goes into the subconscious mind and looks around and tries to find a match for what you're seeing right now. So it digs around and finds a picture of a cow that you experienced before and a memory that someone told you when you were whatever, three years old, this is called a cow, like that. And then the buddhi brings that mm, uh, impression into the conscious mind and matches the two, like that, and then you recognize, this is a cow. Uh, you see? So that's how the buddhi is the interface between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And that's how we recognize everything. And that's how our choices are going on. You see? If you, you, know, you go somewhere, and you see someone, you look at them, and then that triggers the buddhi bringing an impression. And it may be of someone who looked just like that person with whom you had a bad experience in a previous life. And you immediately think, I don't like this person. <laughs> like that. There's no reason, it's just your own impression. Otherwise you meet someone, and then your buddhi brings an impression from a past life that you had it maybe a very close relationship, and that person looks just like that. And it brings, and then Cupid fires his arrow, love at first sight. He <laughs> yeah? says, oh, I like this person very much. So in this way, all of our choices and everything, we feel as if we're making our decisions in real time. But actually what's happening is, each situation is just triggering past sanskars, and we're under the control of them. And so we keep moving through lifetime after lifetime, under the control of the previous impressions. So it's really important. That chitta, it has to be cleansed. Huh? I'm sorry for all the senior devotees, I'm just no, telling something for them. <laughs> you know all of this better than me. So I'm saying for those, the new students. Uh, so, now, for the chitta to move, hmm? all the, when the chitta is peaceful, that's called sattva. So when the chitta is still, you feel peace. When your chitta is still, you feel peace. 
and when it's oscillating, then passion, desires. Desires are just oscillations of the chitta. So if you make your chitta clean and steady, then desires just disappear. And sometimes the chitta contracts so much and has so many oscillations that they all interfere with each other and your brain can't function anymore. And then it becomes tamas and you get angry, you can't think straight, you can't make proper decisions, or you get so drunk that you just become unconscious. So these are, these are how the gunas function, the three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas in the mind. Now, when the sattva is there, when there's peace in the mind, the mind naturally expands. And then when there's tamas and rajas, it naturally contracts. So it expands and contracts. And this is why when you feel happiness, you feel light. Inside you feel light, you feel actually mentally illuminated and light also. And you can think about big subjects, but when you become disturbed, then you're just focused on one thing. You can't see the big picture because the consciousness has contracted and it's not functioning properly. So, in order for the mind to expand and contract, it needs some medium needs a field to, to move. So that is called Akash. People say space or ether, that is called Akash. So in Srimad Bhagavatam, there Kapil Dev, he says, Bhutanam Chitradatvitvam Bahir Antram Evacha Pranindriyatma Disnetvam Nabaso Lakshanam This is the definition of the element called Akash. And it means it gives a space for the mind to move. And it gives space for the pran to move. And space for the um, indriya, the senses. In other words, the element of akash ether is the junction. It's the meeting place where your senses, your pran and your mind meet. This is very important to understand because people think, well, what I put in my mind is not going to affect my activity or what I do in my life with my activity is not going to affect my mind. But this is absolutely not true because these three things, your senses, your pran and your mind all meet together in the plane of Akash. So if you do any uh, sinful or re irreligious activities with the senses, your mind is going to become polluted and it will contract. If you put some poison in your mind in the form of ill thoughts or bad association, that will affect your sense and then you'll act like that later. You know, many psychologists previously, they said, oh, if you see any violent movies or sexual movies or anything, it doesn't affect you. It's not going to affect you. And by the way, I'm also going to pay $20 million for a 30-second ad during the Super Bowl. Because what you see doesn't affect you. Right? Uh, so, this is very important to understand. So, what is Dharma? What is religion? What is culture? It is that lifestyle which causes the gradual expansion of your chitta in the akash. And the more it expands, the lighter it becomes, and you naturally become filled with knowledge. Huh? Sattvam sanjayate jnana, I mean Gita Krishna said, from sattva gun comes jnana, knowledge. Here, that is transcendental knowledge of the spiritual world, but the power to discriminate between matter and spirit, to experience intuitively, I am not this body, I am a soul. Consciousness is not an epiphenomena, it's not a product of the brain, it's something categorically distinct from matter. Some people get it and some people don't get it. Who gets it? Those whose chitta is expanded and clean, they feel it. And if the chitta is contracted, then you just completely feel like this body, fully. And you, you can't imagine even that, this, that you're anything more than that. So it all depends on this expansion and contraction of the chitta. Now, when, when you focus your mind on something, you fix your mind on something, uh, 
the mind is not going from many different subjects, then it automatically becomes peaceful because it's focused on one thing and it expands. And this is why people have their uh, attractions in life to different activities. You know, like some people, they like soccer. Uh, it gives them happiness. Why? Because for 90 minutes, their mind is completely in trance on that ball. Well, they're completely fixed. Everyone, 50,000 people in the stadium, they're all completely. Otherwise, they can't concentrate. You know, so many things are going. But here now, psh. so as soon as the mind is fixed on one thing, it psh, starts to, and everyone feels. Krishna said in Gita, Asantasya Kutasu Kam, without shanti, without peacefulness, there's no sukh. So the absorption in one thing, right, because m mainly in our life, day to day things, you have to juggle with so many threats coming from all different dimensions. Right? The mind is in a state of disturbance, you don't feel happy. And when a person just gets a break and watches a soccer or something, then their mind is fixed on one thing and it begins to... But the problem is when the match is over, it just contracts again. They don't know how to make a permanent expansion of consciousness. And it's the same with anything. Some people just... They, they just get absorbed in ice cream, you know, whatever it is in your life. Some people become absorbed in sex, some people become absorbed in whatever, some sport, jogging, climbing, whatever it is. And they just put their mind fully in that, but they're all, in principle, it's all the same thing with everyone. They forget everything else, focus on one thing, and the chitta starts to uh, um, expand in the Akash, and they feel peace and happiness, then when Monday comes, and when the weekend's over, then it contracts again, like that. So, we need to know how we can expand our consciousness permanently without it contracting again and again. So Sanskrit is a very interesting language. The word Akash in Sanskrit means ether. But there's another word for Akash, that is Ka. Uh, you've heard of that Ka in Gita Krishna Shabda Kei Bhaurasham Rishu. I am the sound in the ether. So here K means in the Ka is K. Uh, so the syllable Ka means ether. So when your uh, ether, uh, in the ether your chitta is expanded, then that's called beautiful ether. That's a beautiful Akash. Su, so that's called sukha. And when you're in a situation where there's a contraction, that do, do means the um, bad. Dukha. So even we have words in English like happiness and distress, but they don't really tell us anything other than we think whatever, a smiley emoticon or something like that. But Sanskrit is so nice. Even the word for happiness and distress, sukha, actually ontologically, existentially, cos cosmologically explains to you exactly what's happening. Sukha, your chitta is expanding in the ether, so you feel peaceful and happiness. And Dukkha, that's a crunch. And then you, you feel miserable. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is saying, first thing, Chaito Dharpana Mahajana, Everyone chants. So just before the class, everyone was standing, we were dancing, and there was a beautiful symphony of so many voices, all chanting. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Like that. And everyone was all faces were shining. So everyone was feeling happiness. Some were crying. They don't even know why. <laughs> huh? But why? Because the, this chanting of the holy name expands your chitta in the akash and you're feeling great. So the more you chant, the greater you will feel. <laughs> hmm? chant, and be happy. Uh, chant and be happy. Yeah. <laughs> so chant, chant and chant as much as you can, continuously. Some days you have some obstacles, but and you keep chanting, 
gradually, gradually, that subconscious mind will become nirmal. Now when the chitta is nirmal, it takes on a wonderful quality. Kapil Dev also in the third canto describes, he gives a definition of the element of chitta. He says, Swachatvam, Avikaritvam, Shantatvam, Itichecha Saha. So, Shantatvam means when the chitta is uh, clean, all the impressions have been wiped away, then you become undisturbed by rag and dwesh, attachment and aversion. That's a really, that's a really nice thing. You see, even when you're enjoying and you're happy in your nice situation and whatever, you're sipping a pina colada on the beach, <laughs> but that's not really happiness. Because your mind still has attachments and aversions. Even if you feel quite good, but relatively speaking, it's nothing. It's nothing. But if the chitta can become steady and clean, then all attachments and aversions go away. You feel like, oh, finally, my whole life I was being strangled. And now that person let go. Because that was Maya. Strangling us. Then that, that is blissful. To have no bodily identification and know that you're eternal part and parcel of God, that's blissful. That's not even the beginning of the bliss, actually. That's just the freedom from the suffering of material existence. Bhava Maha Davagni Nirabhanam. The fire of material existence goes out. The real bliss starts after that. But relative to worldly life, uh, very wonderful thing. So, that is a shantattva. Then the, an, another quality of the purified chitta is avikaritva. There's no uh, modification, oscillation. And so that means one becomes free from lie and vikshep. Vikshep means distraction. If you want to meditate, it's not easy. The mind is like the wind going here and there. It's difficult. And if I say to you, think of anything except for an apple. You can't do it. Try. <laughs> oh, you, you just think of an apple. You can. Mind is completely uncontrollable. Huh? So, when it be avikaritvam, undis undistracted, you can focus completely. And lie means no laziness, lethargy of the mind as well, no dullness. Then, and the most important quality comes now, swachatvam. Swachatna means pure, clear, and especially it means, uh, according to the commentaries, Bhagavad Bimba Grahitva, that your chitta, your psychological body being clean and shining and bright, now becomes Bhagavad Bimba Grahitva, it becomes capable of catching the reflection of the form of God. So you can see God. We're not playing games. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement is a movement to teach everyone how you can see Krishna. You can meet with Krishna and serve Him. That's why we're here. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Chaito Darpana Marjanam. Go on chanting very carefully, without offense. Subconscious mind will be cleansed and when it's purified, <coughs> When you chant, you will see the beautiful <coughs> lotus feet of Krishna. Or walking in the dust of Vrindavan. Your heart will palpitate. Wow. Hope he doesn't step on a thorn. Because his feet are so soft and fragrant. Krishna, don't step on anything. Come and sit down here. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came in this Kali Yuga to establish Yuga Dharma. All jivas chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. It will solve all of your problems forever. And you will realize God and you will fall in love with Him. This is why Mahabhu came. This is the external secondary reason. 
Now the primary reason. Okay, now all the persons who are coming for the first time, if from this point in the class you don't understand anything that I say, don't worry. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> After some time, okay, you'll catch it, but it may take some time. So, the, the primary external reason has been described by Srila Rupa Goswami in Vidagda Madhav. Anarpita charim chirat kurunaya varti nahakalo. Rupa Goswami, he saw, he was an eyewitness that Krishna and Radhika in one form of Chi Chaitanya Mahaprabhu along with all their devotees, all the gopis and other associates of Braja and along with all the devotees of all the incarnations as well appeared in this world and he manifested a festival of transcendental love. And seeing that, Rupa Goswami Pad was overwhelmed with ecstasy. And then he wrote, Anarpita charim chirat kurunaya vartina kalo. Chitanima avatirna kalo. He has descended in this Kali Yuga. When did he descend? He descended at the time of Surya Grahan, the time of a lunar eclipse. So in India, the lunar eclipse is considered to be astrologically inauspicious. So, at that time, to protect themselves, everyone, and even atheists, even don't believe, just to, you know, make sure, take no chances, they jump in the Ganges and chant, Hari, 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 uh, so that the Rahu, the influence of the planet Rahu, will not come and take away all their good karmas, uh, take away their piety. So, the moment Mapu appeared in this world, already he was making everyone chant the holy names. But it has a very deep significance. Chandra Grahan means solar lunar eclipse. Mm -hmm. But Chandra Grahan, here Chandra means Chandra Mukhi, Radhika. Radhika, whose face is like a beautiful moon, Grahan means to accept the embrace. That Krishna has accepted the embrace of Radhika. Sometimes Krishna embraces Radhika. And sometimes Radhika, she becomes very bold and she embraces Krishna and she plays the role of Krishna and makes Krishna play her role. So when Radhika makes Krishna play her role, that is called Chandra Grahan. So that is the significance that Radhika has made Krishna play her role and now he's appearing doing Leela. It's Krishna himself but absorbed in the bhavs, in the ecstatic moods of Srimati Radhika and covered by her golden complexion. So, anarpita charim charat karunaya vati naha kalo samarpaitum unnat ujjvala rasam sabakti se Hari purata sundar juti He is Hari. That means, he is like a lion. So, elephants, male elephants plays with the female elephants and they become completely intoxicated. But the moment a lion comes and <laughs> then all their intoxication disappears, they become sober in a second. They immediately become alert. So by this verse, Rupa Goswami is saying, may the golden form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appear in the, as a sporty, a vision, in the innermost region of your heart. Because in this Kali Yuga, everyone is intoxicated with sense gratification. But the moment they see the golden form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all that madda, intoxicated mood, goes away and they become alert to their spiritual welfare. So, another reason is, Hari Purata Sundara Juti Kadamba Samdi Pitaha. He is Hari like a lion and he has the complexion of molten gold. So he's mentioning this because. The pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are extremely gambir, inscrutable, mysterious, deep, profound, very difficult to understand. So he's thinking, what can I tell you about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela? But he's giving a blessing, Spuratuva. If that golden form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will appear for a moment in your heart, only seeing his golden form, then you will gradually you'll immediately get prem and gradually understand everything. 
because Krishna has appeared with Radhika's bhav in order to relish and realize her mood and with her complexion in order to distribute it. It's the golden effulgence of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that distributes this preem. You can see once Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was going from Jagannath Puri on his way to Vrindavan. So the king, Pratabharudra Maharaj, he knew, oh, he's coming to Katak. So he told his uh, servants, when he comes, wherever he goes, you arrange one house for him to stay, bring from Puri Jagannath Mahaprasadam for him. Wherever he takes bath in the river, like the Mahanadi River or Bhagavi River, then you should immediately mark that place and afterwards make a ghat there and with a sign saying, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took bath here. So the king was doing everything to serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and record the history of wherever he went. But he was also thinking that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a sannyasi, so he never meets with any ladies. So all the queens and princesses in my royal court, they don't have a chance to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he arranged some elephants. And on the back of the elephants, they had big palanquins with uh, curtains all the way around. <laughs> and inside, behind the curtains, all the queens and princesses were there, peeping out. <laughs> so Pratapurudh Maharaj had the elephants situated on the side of the road where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was coming past. And so Mahaprabhu is going to Vrindavan. Krishna, 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 Krishna Krishna Rakshama Rama Ragava Rama Ragava Rama Ragava Rakshama Krishna Keshava Krishna Keshava Krishna Keshava Pahima He's in such high ecstatic love for Krishna and he was passing on the road and those queens and princesses they just peeped out from the curtains on the backs of the elephants and just seeing him from far away, they began to cry, their hairs were standing on end, their bodies were trembling and they became overwhelmed with brain. E mona kripala nahi shuni tribhuvane Krishna prema hoi yara dura darshane Krishna Das Kavraj Goswami said, Never in the history of the world has anyone heard of anyone so merciful as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, only seeing him from far away. And those persons would immediately become overwhelmed with love for God. So, this is the meaning. Hari Purata Sundara Duti Kadamba Sandi Pitaha. That seeing that golden complexion manifest in your heart, then we can. There's no question of his giving and our taking, it happens automatically by his golden complexion. Because this golden complexion is Radhika's complexion. Her Mahabhav, and it's the nature of Mahabhav. It has one quality called Yavad Ashrai Vriti, that it expands out from her and enters into anyone close enough to see or hear. Asan Janata Ritvilolan and churns their hearts. So Hari Purata Sundar Jyoti Gitamba Sandi Pitaha. Now one may say, why has Krishna come to do this pastime of distributing brain everywhere? And the reason is because he was thinking to himself, Oh, when I came as Krishna in Vrindavan, I wasn't very generous, really. He didn't give frame to so many persons uh, when Krishna came to this world. Only those he had confirmed were qualified, he gave frame to them. Like Muchukunda Maharaj. Muchukunda Maharaj had been a great devotee for thousands of years. And he was asleep in a cave. And Krishna, running away from Kala Yavan, went all the way to the cave just to give Prem to Muchukunda Maharaj. So he went here and there, he gave some Prem here and there. He gave Prem to the wives of Kaliya also. And to the Yagyapatnis, the wives of the Brahmas. But not so much. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who was going everywhere and to lions and tigers, deer in the forest, fallen sinful persons, everyone, to trees and creepers, he was giving brain. So he said, Muktim Dadati Kahichits Bhakti Yoga. If someone worships Krishna, they can easily get liberation, but he re very rarely gives bhakti. So to remove the fault of his own miserliness, Krishna thought, I am now will come as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
I now distribute prem everywhere. So now, what someone may say that to give a great valuable treasure to an unqualified person is not correct because in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna said there's charity in the mode of goodness, in the mode of passion, in the mode of ignorance. So in the mode of goodness, when you give the correct charity to a qualified person at the right time, without any attachment to the results, that's charity in the mode of goodness. But if you give charity to someone, thinking, oh, did everyone see how much I gave to him? And now everyone will respect me as a very generous person to get prestige for yourself. And you're also thinking, Oh, when you give in charity to someone, it comes back to you in your next life a thousand times. So, uh, in this life I'm rich, but next life I'll be so rich. And so, get this. So when you're giving charity, you're really attracted. You want to get something back from it. Then this is charity in the mode of passion. And if you give mm, something to an unqualified person mm, at a you know at the wrong time, the wrong thing, like then this is called charity in the mode of ignorance. So for Krishna to give the highest treasure of Goloka Vrindavan to all types of fallen people in Kali Yuga. What is this? <laughs> there's something, there's a reason why would he do that? Because Krishna, you know, Yad Yad Acharati Shaisa, he sets example for others. Why would he do that? So the reason is this. When Krishna came to this world, he experienced so many beautiful loving exchanges. Especially, sometimes when he was in with Radhika, she would go into the highest state of love, Madanakya Mahabhav. And he was wondering, what is that? I can't understand. What is she saying? She's speaking incoherently. What joy is she feeling? And sometimes in the course of his Leela also, Krishna would leave Vrindavan and, and go away for many years in Mathura and in Dwarka. And then finally, he returned and came back to Vrindavan. And when he met with Radhika and Gopis, there in Vrindavan, also when they met at Kurukshetra, then this joy of meeting together after long separation is called Samriddhima and Sambhog. A fully nourishing, nourished, successful, flourishing, uh, prosperous union. Samriddhima and Sambhog. So there's great happiness in this. But Krishna would experience Radhika's See her Madanakya Mahabhav now and then, and the Samridhi Man Sambhog only after many years of separation from time to time. But when Radha and Krishna became one in the form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then he experienced continuously Radhika's Madanakya Mahabhav. And the Samridhi Man Sambhog, a union that even he did not experience in Krishna Leela, that is where. Though Radhika embraces Krishna in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, every pore of the skin of Radhika is embracing every pore of the skin of Krishna. In this Goranga Swarup. So when Krishna experienced this Goranga Swarup, he became so ecstatic. He felt like oh, he had conquered the world. So the example is given of a, of a king. If a king leaves his country, goes all over the world and conquers all the other kings and becomes an emperor. They all pay tribute to him and they give him so many boxes full of treasure like gold and silver coins and uh, jewels. So then the king, he returns to his capital and when he comes back to his capital, all his citizens line the streets and he has a victory parade. And when the king is riding on a golden chariot, with so many ministers and all the boxes of treasure through the street and all his citizens are saying Jai, Jai Maharaj, Jai Maharaj then the king, he just puts his hand into the boxes of gold coins and jewels and he's throw this is a tradition in Vedic culture when the king becomes emperor he does this procession through the streets and he just throws the jewels and coins into the crowd and all the crowd, beggars Any, anyone can just catch them at that time so in the same way when Krishna experienced is the fully the deep embrace of Radhika in the Gorangas Rup. He thinks now, oh, he's so happy I became the emperor of the world. So he's going everywhere and throwing the priceless jewels of Braja Brahim 
even to beggars and useless sinful persons in Kali Yuga. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Not only that, but when the king is riding on the chariot, his ministers are there as well. And he tells them, you also, and they dig into the treasure troves and they also throw. So when he comes, he comes with Nityananda Prabhu, Advaita Charya, uh, Gadara Pandit, Srivastaka, Rupa Gosa, and they're all grabbing, throwing everywhere. And everyone's becoming very, their lives are becoming successful. So sometimes they give gold coins, sometimes they give valuable jewels, and sometimes chintamani. So gold coins mean sadhan bhakti. You get the sadhan, real sadhana. And jewels, bhav bhakti. And chintamani, brain. Krishna mm. brain. So, but some persons don't get. They are kapati, those who are very duplicitous. So there are three types of duplicitous persons who can't catch any coins. So don't be one of them. <laughs> They're called Dan Kapati, Bal Kapati and Prem Kapati. Dan Kapati means duplici du duplicity in regard to wealth. A person, they have some money and they invest huge and huge amounts of money in trying to just make more money. But when it comes to Uh, giving anything for the service of Krishna and Guru and Vaishnavas, it's like pulling teeth. Hmm? They just give a little bit. So that is called Dan Kapati, duplicity in regards to wealth. So they don't get any jewels or coins. Hmm? Then the second one is called Bal Kapati. That is duplicity in regard to strength. So you have en energy, you have physical energy, but when the Kirtan comes, you don't dance. Tandava Nritya, you know, like Lord Shiva when he's destroying the universe. You have to dance like that. <laughs> Just throw yourself in the kirtan and fully dance with your full energy. Mm -hmm. So that person who doesn't give his full energy in Harinam Sankirtan, they're called Balkapati, they also don't get any jewels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the last one is called Prem Kapati. <coughs> Prem Kapati means that person, they don't have Prem love for Krishna, but they're not feeling any anxiety that they don't have love for Krishna. This is really important. Or they pretend that they have love. This is problematic. So, if a devotee will feel Prema dhana bina bhyarta daridra jivan dasa kori vetan mari deho prema dhan Mahapu has set the example. He said, Without the treasure of brain, I am a poverty-stricken beggar. My, I'm destitute. My life is completely worthless. Alas, alas, Krishna, please bless me with this divine love. Make me your servant and pay me the salary of brain. Hmm? So some anxiety should be there. And then those persons, they'll definitely catch some jewels that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is distributing. So Rupa Goswami is saying, Sadaride Akandre Spratuva Sachinandana. May that beautiful golden form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appear in your heart. His name is Sachinandan. At the end of the verse, he said Sachinandan. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu loves his mother. Sachi is the name of his mother. Nandan means son. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu loves his mother so much. When he was 24 years old, he left Navadweep and he accepted the renounced order of life, sannyas. But Nityanand, he wanted to go to Vrindavan. But Nityanand Gubayatrik brought him back to uh, Navadweep Dham and he came to the house of Advaita Chari in Shantipur. So then news came out, Mahaprabhu is back. And everyone went rushing, rushing to Advaita Chari's house in Shantipur. So Advaita Charya sent some servants, go and bring Sachi Mata on a palanquin. So they went to Mayapur and they put Mother Sachi as a guest of Anya and they carried her there on a palanquin. And she got down and then she saw her son for the first time, shaved head, saffron cloth. She was crying so much she couldn't even see him. So many tears were flowing. And she took her son in her lap and was kissing him. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was wiping away the tears of his mother. He said, forgive me. I have given up my true uh, dharma, my true uh, duty. That's to serve you. 
Just tell, say the word and I'll come home. Such a person. She said, before I thought that I was so fortunate, I thought that you are my son and having you as my son, this is the greatest treasure of my life. But now you've left me. I think that all my impious, whatever impious activities of my past life, the fruit of that has come at once. Now I am so unfortunate. Before people would honor me, but now they'll consider I'm inauspicious. If I could just, if I could just die now, I could should be free from the pain of public condemnation. Now they'll think, oh, look at that widow. Even her son left her. She, she said, no one will even say my name. So Nimai, he was wiping away the tears of Sachi. He said, oh, mother, that's not true. You are always my mother. You will always be my mother. In every life, you are my mother. Mm. And you was, I can never leave you. I am always with you. And if anyone will just say the name Sachinanda, then that person, even if he has no sadhana, at once he purchases me. I become under his control if someone will just say Sachinanda. If someone will just say Sachinanda, then that person will very soon attain all transcendental knowledge. They will get the fruit of perfect study of all Vedanta. That person himself will purchase me. He will become a holy Tirtha. In fact, that person who says, Jai Sachinanda, Jai Sachinanda, Jai Sachinanda, only repeating Sachi, Sachi, Sachi. Then I give myself to him. I become pleased with him in every lifetime. What more can I say? I consider that person is my guru who says the name Sachi. So in this way, Mahaprabhu was pacifying Mother Sachi with sweet words. So the implication is that the holy name, the chanting of the names of Krishna gives everything. But there are obstacles of offenses. So we don't experience the nectar of chanting Hare Krishna. But if someone will call to Mahaprabhu invoking the name of his mother who gave him birth and raised him so lovingly, Jai Satyananda, then very quickly all offenses that that person will go away and they will receive Krishna prayer. So Mahaprabhu is so kind that he gives to everyone, qualified and unqualified, you know. If you make an announcement, everyone come, we're distributing sweet rice, come on. So then everyone will come with their, with their bowls. But if you have no bowl, then what will you do? So someone is standing at the back. So then the person serving the sweet rice might say, hey, what are you doing at the back? Come here. And then they come forward. Why are you standing over there? I don't have a bowl. Okay, I'll give you a bowl. And then they give the person the bowl and then fill it with sweet rice. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is like that. Even though we may not be qualified to receive this highest frame of Braja, but Mahaprabhu calls us and makes us, gives us the patrata, the uh, qualification, the container, and then he fills that container full of frame. So Chaito Darpanamajanam means first he cleans and makes our heart fit receptacle. And then he gives Krishna brain through the chanting of the Holy Name. So an apita charim charat karuna yavatina kalo samarpaitum unnat ujjwala rasam svabhakti sriyam. He is giving unnat ujjwala rasa. What is that? Actually, without experiencing it, without tasting it himself, he cannot distribute it. That is Radha Dasya. So you can see in Sri Chaitanya Charamrita. It was a full moon evening. Payura says, Tires Purad Pavanali Kalanaya Muhu Brindaran Yasparana Janita Prima Viva Shah Kochit Krishna Vriti Prachala Rasano Bhakti Rasika Sachetanya Kimme Punara Pidisho Yasati Padam Rupa Goswami, eyewitness. He's saying, When will that day come? Again, I will see Sri Sachinandan Gohari wandering through the beautiful gardens along the shore of the ocean in Jagannath Puri. 
And when he sees the flowers and the trees there illuminated by the moonlight, then he becomes overwhelmed with love remembering transcendental Vrindavan. At that time, he told Saurabh Damada, Oh, Sloka Poro, recite some verses. And Saurabh Damada Goswami, he began to recite Rasa Lila. He is very learned from the beginning. Bhagavana Pitara tree, shadowed full of Malika, Viksharanta Manaschakre Yoga Maya Mupashitaha. Drishta Kumadvanta Makanda Mandalam Ramana Nanam Like this, each verse of Rasa Lila, he was telling one after another. And Mahaprabhu was dancing and listening completely absorbed in the beautiful Rasalila of Radha and Krishna. So he got to the point where Saurabh Damada, he said, Tabiye yuta, ya tabiye yuta asramam pohita manga sanga, grista asra jaswa kucha kunkuma ranjitaya, gandava pali bi anudrata avi sadhva, sranto gajibi ibaradi bhavinna setu. After dancing, Krishna and Braj Gopis, they were perspiring. And the perspiration had melted the kungum, the cosmetic on the bodies of Braj Gopis. And they embraced Krishna and his garlands were crushed and smeared with the kungum from their breasts. And Krishna thought, oh, they're so exhausted, tired from uh, dancing. We should become refreshed by entering into the Jamuna. So just like an elephant enters into a river with his so many female mates, so in the same way, Sri Krishna, along with Radhika and so many gopis, they came onto the bank of Jamuna and entered into the water there. And the fragrance of his garland with the kumkum from the gopis was attracting so many bumblebees. Hmm. And just as the Gandharvas sing songs and glorify Lord Narayan, he was like that. So many bumblebees were <laughs> as if singing the glories of Krishna like Gandharvas. Okay. He is compared to an elephant. Why? Because when Ibaradi Babinna say to just as when an elephant comes on the bank of the sandy bank of the Jamuna, the elephant's very heavy and as he steps on the bank it collapses. Okay? Because the bank goes like this. And the banks break and collapse as you enter into the water. So he's breaking the boundaries. So in the same way, see Krishna, he's like an elephant and he's breaking the boundaries of all dharma. Yeah. Not actually because he's transcendental, but in his lila as a young boy, a village boy, he has no care in the world. All boundaries are broken. And he's entering into Jamuna with so many gopis. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard this verse, he looked and he saw the moon reflected off the ocean in Jagannath Puri. And he thought it was Jamuna, and he saw what was being described by Saurabh Damada, Krishna and Braj Gopis entering in, into Jamuna. And Mahaprabhu himself just ran and <laughs> they didn't even see where did he go. And he disappeared under the waves. So as you know, uh, they were searched for him everywhere. And then they discovered that a fisherman had caught him in a net. So when they they approached Mahaprabhu, they began to do kirtan, and slowly he came out from his internal consciousness, and he was looking at the sky, seeing things that no one could see, and he began speaking. He said, I saw Radha and Krishna and Prajagopis. They'd been dancing together, and they entered into the Jamuna. But before they went into the Jamuna, there were so many young Younger gopis, they made servants, and they helped remove their clothing and ornaments and dress them in a fine dress gopis in fine white cloth, and they stayed on the bank, and Radha Krishna and the sakis went into the water, and they were splashing each other. Sometimes Krishna would pick up Radhika and take her out into the deep current and drop her, <laughs> and then she would have to hold on to him. Because when she's in anxiety and she chastises him, her face becomes more beautiful. So sometimes he, Krishna does things to provoke her just to see that beauty. Sometimes Krishna was catching gopis and they tried to escape from him. And the gopis all went to, there was like a bank full of beautiful golden lotus flowers. And the gopis sunk into the water up to their necks. So their faces are golden like lotus flowers and their lotus flowers each side. So Krishna couldn't see them. 
where they were hiding. So in this way they were playing together beautifully in the water. And then after Mahapu said, but I was standing on the bank with the maidservants. And then after some time they came out from the water and we dried their bodies and then smeared them with sandalwood paste and kasturi and a guru. And then Brinda Devi had made so many ornaments out of flowers, crown, garlands, garments. So then we decorated Radha and Krishna entirely in the Pushpavesh. In the entire outfit just made of different colored fragrant flowers from the forest. And they look so beautiful. And then we had prepared a spread of so many different types of fruits, pomegranate, mango, and banana, and pineapple, and everything chopped and arranged in beautiful patterns. And, they, and Radha and Krishna sat down together dressed in flowers. They're laughing and joking with each other and feeding each other. And then Radha Krishna got up and went into a kunj, a bower, a beautiful cottage. And they went inside. And some of the Sakis, their friends, they went to a distance. But the younger girls, they went inside with them. And Radha Krishna lay down on a bed. And they were massaging their feet. And the younger girls were massaging their feet. Mahapu said, I went inside. And they were massaging their feet, fanning with the chamar, giving them a tambul to chew. And then, Radha Krishna, they went to sleep. And those younger girls, they just lay down there in the kunj. And they also went to sleep. Then suddenly I heard a sound. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And now I am here. <laughs> So, this means that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, he tasted Radha Dasyam. He was tasting what it means, because mainly he came to this world to experience Radharani's mood of serving Krishna. But here in this pastime of Chaitanya Taramrita there, it's described that Mahaprabhu is experiencing what it's like to be a younger personal attendant. Uh, rendering all types of direct bodily services to Radha and Krishna. So, when Krishna disappeared from Rasalila, Braj Gopis were weeping. Radhika said, Yate sujata charanam buruham staneshu Vetashanai priyadadi mahika kaseshu Tainata vimmata sitad vyata taina kimswit Kurpadi bi brahmati di babudaya shamna O Krishna, why are you wandering around in the forest in the dark? Where are you? You may step on a stone. I cannot tolerate it. Even when we're alone together and I hold your lotus feet on my heart, I lower your lotus feet onto my heart very slowly, thinking your feet are so soft. Even my mm, uh, breast will give some pain to you. So now I cannot imagine. But my mind is becoming mad thinking that your soft lotus feet are wandering in the dark forest. You should come at once. If you will not return, I have no chance to serve you. Then. I should just die right now and let the remainder of my lifespan be added to your life so that you can have a long and happy life in Vrindavan. <laughs> so, Braja Gopis are like this. Their minds are thinking of Krishna's soft lotus feet. Actually, the lover, she wants to serve her beloved to be on the chest of the beloved. But when Prem becomes very deep, then humility rises and one feels Krishna Prema e eka apurva prabhav Guru samulagu ke karai dasya bhav Love for Krishna has one astonishing quality and that is that whether you are junior to Krishna, equal to Krishna or superior to Krishna, it makes everyone feel das. I want to be his servant. So we see this everywhere. Just like Nanda Maharaj, when he was in separation, 
from Krishna. Krishna had gone to Mathura and he was speaking with Uddhav. Uddhavji was trying to tell him, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Nanda Maharaj said, Look, I don't want to get into a discussion with you whether Krishna is Brahman or not Brahman. I just want to know when will he come back to Vrindavan. <laughs> anyway, if you say he's Parabrahman, then Manaso Vrityo Yasur, Krishna Padam Buddhasraya, Vacho Bidaini Namnam, Kayastat Pravanadishu. May my Chitta Vritti, may all my thoughts, Simply be at the shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. May my words only speak his name and glorify him and may my body always be bowing down to him. So his father, his guru, his senior to Krishna. But in separation, in praying, when the great wave of humility comes, then he takes a position like a das. It's not his taibhav, it's a sanchi bhav for a moment. So this is a very high level of love. So in the same way, you see also in Brahma Vimohan Lila, Krishna became all the coward boys and calves, right? But he didn't tell Balaram. He never told Balaram. So one day, Balaram saw that all the cows are more attached to their older calves than the younger ones. And all the boys, the, the men, the coward men, more attached to their sons, just like they're attached to Krishna. And Balaram was thinking, what's going on? And Yogamaya was covering. Gradually, when Yogamaya removed, then Balaram realized, Krishna, they're all you. And then Balaram calls Krishna Prabhu. Why? Because he was feeling such humility. My brother, I'm so close to him, but he never even told me. Why didn't he tell me? And he... He was feeling such humility. So then he called, though he's the older brother, but he called Krishna Prabhu. Yeah? So in the same way, Radharani, in separation, she says, King Karinam Grinite Bhujam Aguru Sugandam Murjidas Tatkadanu. Oh, Bumblebee? She's talking to a Bumblebee. Now Krishna is in Mathura. Does he remember me sometimes? Does he sometimes talk about us, his King Karis? Does he sometimes talk about uh, Kinkri means maid servants? Hmm? Does Krishna sometimes say, sometimes he's uh, with the princesses in Mathura and he says, Oh, you royal princesses, you're so educated, you're so sophisticated. Not like those village girls that grew up in the dairy farm. Does he sometimes speak about us negatively like this? Or does he sometimes speak about us positively and tell those girls in Mathura, oh, you can't make garlands like my gopis. <laughs> does Krishna sometimes dress himself and then look in a mirror in Mathura and then noticing that the shirt he's wearing was actually sewn by the gopis themselves? see his, comp his reflection in the mirror and become devastated in separation and forget who he is and then criticize himself and talk to his own reflection. I am so cruel. But at least you, you are remembering them, you're wearing their shirt. But I am so cruel, how could I forget the gopis of Vrindavan? So Radharani is in separation. She feels so humble and she says, King Kari, I am a King Kari. I'm just a maid servant of Krishna. So, when that bhav comes, though the lover is positioned, is on the chest, the chest of Krishna, but when praying becomes very high, they think, oh, I want to serve the feet. You can see in Panayagit, when Krishna told Gopis, return to your homes. They'd left everything for him, but Krishna said, now you've seen the forest, you should go back. Then Braj Gopis said, Yahyam bujakshatabu padatalam ramaya datakshanam kochidaranya jana priyasya asprakshmatat prabiti anya samast samanja 
Anya Samanya Anja Statum Stoya Biramita Bata Parayama Sri Yat Padam Bujurajas Chakame Tulasya Ladva Bivakshasi Padam Kila Bricha Jushtam Yascha Swavikshana Mutanya Sura Prayasas Tatvam Bayam Chatava Padaraja Prapanna Chris said, you should go back, go home to your husbands. They said, O oh Krishna, if Lakshmi Devi has the chance to touch your lotus feet for one moment, then she would think this is a great festival of joy. So what to speak of us? Since that moment, we touched your lotus feet. They bowed down and touched when they came. Rasa Lila. They said, from that moment, just the touch of your lotus feet, we became overwhelmed with such a bliss that we are unable to stand even for one second in the presence of any other man. O oh Krishna, you know that Lakshmi Devi, she attains a place on the chest of Lord Narayan, but she would rather be at the feet of Lord Narayan, even though she has to share those lotus feet with many other servants like Tulsi Devi. So in the same way, we have come to you, not for our happiness. We have simply come to serve the dust of your lotus feet. So when praying is very high, then this Charna Bhakti, devotion to Krishna's lotus feet comes. So we are describing this verse. Don't wander around in the forest. Why do you want to keep your feet there? Keep your feet on my heart. So how radical is dedicated, absorbed in love for Krishna and when that prem is very high and humility is very high, she simply thinks at every moment of his soft lotus feet. So in the same way, we are using this as a comparison, the, the dasis, the maid servants of Radhika, they feel the same way about Radhika's lotus feet. Try to understand what is Radha Dasya. Ananya si Radha pada kamala dasya ika rasadi hare sange rangam sapana samaye na api dadati Balat Krishna Kurba Sakav Divi Kimapya Charitika Pyudasar Mahaveti Pralapati Mamatma Chahasati. Srila Prabhupada Nanda Sarasati Thakur said, The Manjuris, the maidservants of Radhika, Ananya Sira, their mind is one pointed, completely absorbed in the rasa, the mellows of service to Radhika's lotus feet. And they never, even in their dreams, Think of directly meeting and enjoying pastimes with Krishna. In that, this is very important, you see. When you're awake, when you're awake, your buddhi is functioning. So there's certain things that you have sanskars, impressions. Maybe you have done things in the past. But if it will come in your mind, you won't do it. Because your, your buddhi is like a security lock. And it's, okay, don't do that, don't do this, it will be problematic. But when you dream, then the lock is off. And all kinds of thoughts of things that you'd never do while you're awake come in your mind. Uh, because all the sanskars come. So it means if there's something that you won't even do in your dreams, that means even those sanskars are not there. Those impressions are not there. So the maidservants of Radhika, even in their dreams, they never even think of themselves dancing and embracing and performing pastimes with Krishna. They're completely only thinking of the lotus feet of Radhika. So if Krishna will catch them and pull at their cloth, then Mahamatma Chahasati, they say, no, stop, stop, stop. Oh, Radhika, please save me. And Radharani laughs so much seeing their dedication to her. So that mood of one-pointed Dasya Bhav to the lotus feet of Radhika, this is Unnata Ujjwala Rasam Swabhakti Sriyam the great hidden treasure that was never distributed at any time before. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving this through the chanting of the holy names. 
So chanting of the holy names is yuga dharma. And by that you can easily get liberation or go to Vaikuntha. But that is Mahaprabhu's the secondary external meaning. But the primary purpose of his appearance, primary external purpose is to samarpaitum unnata ujvarasam, to give this. So to, to receive that, then it's essential to have braj, rasik, rupanuga, vaishnav, sangha. Otherwise, if one is chanting in a just whatever, according to one's own understanding, then one may get liberation, one may go to Vaikuntha, one may go to Golok even. But to attain this Unnata Ujjwala Rasam Sobhaktisriya, then one must chant and hear under the guidance of Rupanuga, Brajrasik, Vaishnava, those who are deeply absorbed in that love for the service of Radhika's lotus feet. And by hearing from them, then rati vasanaya swadvi basate basate kapi kasyachit. It means that then you will develop the sanskars that make one very, very eager and greedy to attain that particular type of love. So without Brajrasik Vaishnav Sangha, not possible. Therefore, along with Mahapu came Saurabh Damada, Rai Ramananda, Rupa Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami, and also all of our Acharyas have come. So, in this way, Rupa Goswami described the external reason for Mahapu's appearance. And Saurabh Damada Goswami has described the internal reason. So tomorrow, we want to discuss the three internal reasons why three desires Krishna fulfilled in Gora Lila. And also in that Gora Lila, Radharani in Krishna Lila also had three desires that were not fulfilled. So we want to describe tomorrow the three desires of Radharani which were also fulfilled by this in this Gora Lila. And the Sakis of Radharani also. Lalita, Vishaka, Rupa, Manchava, they also had three desires that were not fulfilled in Krishna Lila, double fulfilled in Gora Lila. So, this we want to describe tomorrow. Gora Premanande. Sri Sachinandan Gohari Ki Jai. Are there any questions? some relativity as, as compared to chit vastu as spiritual substance but then again it goes down to sattva rajas tama so it's, it can be by contrast tama guna but then relative again in the cosmology how the world is created the, f the first of the um, elements which are considered to be tamasic transformation of ahankar is shabda sound and then uh, sorry just yeah, sound and from sound comes akash and then uh, the sense of uh, touch shabda and then air and then the sense of vision form group and then fire and then the sense of taste and water and then the sense of fragrance and then earth so all the gross elements, they're called Pancha Mahabhut, and the Pancha Tanmatra, that is the, the five sense objects which are real, their qualities, they're all the tamasic transformation of Ahankar. They're all tamasic transformation of Ahankar. So any kind of sense gratification will put you in bodily consciousness. So we say relatively that whatever vegetarian food is less tamasic than whatever hamburger, right? So we say like this, but actually all the sense objects are tamasic in nature. So anytime the mind is trying to enjoy them, it darkens the chitta. And that's why whatever food is prepared, it's offered to Krishna. And when it, it's offered to Krishna, then it becomes transubstantiated. It becomes in essence, in substance, transcendental. And then when you take it, it purifies us and even gives us a, the... Um, 
the experience of association with Krishna, because he, it's his uh, Adharamrit, the nectar of his lips is in there. But if you try to enjoy Mahaprasadam, <coughs> then the outer aspect of, of the, because you make offense to Mahaprasadam, then a material aspect will act on you and it will put you in the mode of ignorance. Right? Just try it. Just chug back two liters of sweet rice and just <laughs> crash out like this. And, you know, so that's why even Mahaprasadam is transcendental. But to actually experience its transcendental nature, you can't try to enjoy it. You have to have a spirit of seva towards Mahaprasadam. Okay. Is yes, uh, Akash also a space for material elements? Yeah. Yes, but Krishna has created the senses and the elements with a dual function. One is our senses can be used to cause us to be entangled in this world. And another function is that through the Akash, by, by utilizing Akash and Shabda, then what happens is, when you say Krishna's name is Satchidananda, it's transcendental, you can't chant that. But if you have a, a, a mood which is without offense, and you produce a sim the similarity of Krishna's name. It makes a like a, it makes an opening in the akash, and the light of the pure name shines through that. So that's called nam abhas, and that does cheto darpana marjanam. So cheto darpana marjanam, bhava mahadavagni devapanam, shreya kariva chandika vitaram These four things they all come from nam abhas, and then anandam buddhivadanam is bhav. So, it's only the light of the pure name shines through the Akash when you chant without offense and cleans the heart. And some reflection of Krishna comes there. But then, when you come up to the stage of Bhav, because there's some connection, some experience of Krishna again and again when you're chanting in, in Nama Bas, then this rubs against the Chitta and finally the Chitta gives up its quality. So, Vishnu Thakur, he gives the example of um, Parad, and Gandak. Gandak means sulfur and Parag means mercury. So if you get sulfur and mercury and you try to mix them together, actually they don't mix. They just don't mix. But you rub them again and again and again and then suddenly they both give up their nature and it becomes uh, kajal. And you can make some eyeliner for Radharani. So the example here is uh, of the um, Gandak Paradang Gandak. It's like that. Your chitta becomes clean and you're chanting in the stages of in the stage of Nishta you can start to see Krishna's roop, his form, and some qualities. Then, because your pap, your sins have gone, but there's still some pap beej. That means some samskars, impressions of sinful activity. So when you go on chanting in the stage of Nishta, it destroys the pap beej. Then the stage Ruchi comes. So Ruchi is defined, Ruchi Papa Bij Nashat Madhurya Anubhava Ha. Due to the destruction of the seeds of the sinful samskars being destroyed, then one has an experience of Krishna's Madhurya, Madhurya Anubhava, Krishna's sweetness. So when we begin to experience Krishna's sweetness in the stage of Ruchi, then that's taste, because taste must mean you're tasting something sweet. And that's called taste. So in that stage, that's when the, the sweetness of Krishna is so intoxicating that it makes you forget that He's God. You know, Srila Prabhupada said, I'd come to remind you what you've forgotten, that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Srila Gurudev came and he said, now you have followed Srila Prabhupada for some time, I've come to teach you how to forget Krishna. Forget that Krishna is God. Right? Forget that He's God. Just He's the son of Nanmash, He's a coward boy. So, but you can't do that artificially. You can't just say, okay, Krishna's not God. Is Krishna God? No. This, this, this won't do. All our Goswamis, they know, they can write so many books explaining how Krishna is the Param Tattva. But when you come in the stage of Ruchi, then when you're absorbed in Harinam, and you begin to see Krishna's form and qualities, then His sweetness comes. The sweetness of Krishna is so intoxicating that it covers over the samskar that Krishna's God then you, that's actually, that you forget Krishna's Bhagavata. And then, in the stage of Ruchi, you begin to see, the Chitta opens, it becomes open enough, 
to accommodate Krishna and some parikas, associates as well. So that's called Krishna smaram janam chasya prastam nida samihitam. So when you begin to experience the associates, now you become attracted to one of them and then you do a rope. Their bhava and cheshta, that means their feelings and how they're acting, it naturally reflects into your chitta and your chitta transforms and becomes like them. You know, Patanjali describes this in the Yoga Sutras. When the chitra is very clean, then it transforms and it becomes the object that it's absorbed in. So if a yogi, let's say a yogi wants to know about his digestive system, so he'll just sit and meditate on his navel chakra and then his mind will transform and become all his internal organs. And then he can know about the digestive tract and the intestines and everything. So yogis get knowledge not by cutting people open and seeing what's inside, but by focusing the meditation on any object, then their chitra transform becomes that and they know everything about it. So that one's called yoga ja. So similarly, when the devotee's mind is very steady and now he focuses on the associates, then his chitta transforms and becomes just like them. And there's an arope, a superimposition of their bhavs and their activities. And then that's called tistan brajay tadanuragi jananogami, following the associates. So then that will come in the next stage, asakti. There's, that's the abhas of your swarup in the stage of asakti. So then you can follow that verse, seva sadaka rupena, Siddha Rupena Chatrahi. Outwardly, following the Goswamis, chanting, remembering, serving the deities, doing kirtan, doing parakrama. But inwardly, then one in his uh, internally realized form can serve Radha and Krishna. So you go on doing this. You go on doing this again and again. And that's like rubbing the mercury and the um, sulfur. And then what happens at a certain point, the Swarup Shakti is having so much effect on the chitta that the chitta melts and becomes one with the swarp shakti. So that's the definite, that's called bhav. Shuddha sattva visheshatma prema suryangsu samyabhak ruchi bis chitta masrinya. The chitta melts due to the influence of the ruchi, the tastes. Kridaso bhava ujite, that's called the stage of bhav. And now you have swarup siddhi, perfect realization of your spiritual form. So then sadhanizo, sadhanizo, after that everything is mercy. How the bhav will become prema, that's mercy. So the stages of bhakti are like that. It's very so you, anyone cannot imitate it. Uh, if someone, they're chanting Nama Parad and they're trying to imagine in their mind they're serving Radha and Krishna, what is this? That just means their intelligence is going in their sanskars, digging, digging out a picture of a boy with a peacock feather and a girl and, you know, the impressions of what boys and girls do like that. It's just all kalpana, imagination. And it's rajasic actually, because this activity of the buddhi is rajasic digging from the memory like this. So everything depends on Naam. The more we chant Naam, the more Chitta becomes clear, then the more Tanam, Rupa, Charitadi, Sukhir, Tananu, all these stages of internal mm -hmm. development unfold. <coughs> so, Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtan. Namal last quick thing. Uh, do I have correct understanding that heart or tree is where these four elements you spoke about? Uh, yeah, if, if you see in Shastra, usually when the word rid is there, heart, it means chitta. Mm? So beyond the mind, beyond the intelligence, beyond the ego, the chitta, the heart. Sometimes that's called arshai, arshai. So that's why it said, when you do sadhu sangha, sajataya shai snig de sadhu sangha sato bare. The person you associate with should be significantly more advanced. They should be very affectionate to you. And they should be ashai. That means the inner region, the chitta, has the, all the impressions in the mood that you want those impressions also. So by hearing from them, because the taste that you have in serving Krishna in a particular way will depend what some scars you get from your association. So I quoted that verse, Rati vasna svadvi basate kapikasya chit. So if you'll associate with someone in Sakiras one day, and Madhuriras another day, and Ramlila another day, and Lachminarayan another day, you get these mixed up impressions. And then when you're chanting, you won't have a specific taste in anything. And so your, your bhav can't become mature. 
So this is why it's very important to seek out the association in the same mood that we want. Well, then we'll just get one set of clear sanskars and then our taste will come in that one type of mood. So you're saying that man, buddhi and ahankar is not part of the heart? They, they contam you see, they, that's contaminated chitta. They, they are devolution of the chitta. So with a devoluted, contaminated chitta, you can't really do anything. That's got to be cleansed. That's the first thing that has to be cleansed up. So it's an impure, impure heart. Right? Yeah, it's an impure heart. Yeah, impure heart. Yes. I was just yes. curious about the medium of the spiritual master in relationship to what you just said, mm -hmm. because that's so relevant. And I'm curious what you have to say about that. Well, there are two types of guru. There are many types, but two types of problems, Diksha Guru and Shiksha Guru. So Diksha Guru gives Diksha Mantra and teaches us how to do Archan. So the process of Diksha is actually called Pancha Sanskar. It's five types of impressions that lead to Paramai Kanti Hetavaha. Baladeva Dibhushan has quoted it from Ayur Ratnavi. Paramai Kanti Hetava. So the Diksha process, five types of Sanskars, giving Tilak, giving a name, giving Mantra, teaching you how to do Puja to the Ishtadeva of your Mantra. Like all of these combine together to make the favorable samskaras that your mind can be one pointed. And but that's in archan. So it's like a Vaidhi Bhakti, but at least the Ishtadev is the right person. But then the shik the role of the Shiksha Guru is to tell the Brajarasakata and Gorakata also. And then this makes samskaras an intense greed. The Diksha is cleaning us up eh, to create the greed. That to enter into bhajan. So, uh, therefore, Krishna Skaraj Goswami, he says, Chaitanya Leela Mritapur, Krishna Leela Sukarpur, Dui Mili Hoi Sumadurya, Dui Mili Hoi Sumadurya, Sadhu Guru Prasade, Tarje Aswade, Sehijani Madhurya Praturya. Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela, his pastimes are the Amritapur, full of nectar. And the Leela of Krishna is like Karpur, Kamfa. And when these two are mixed together, it becomes excessively sweet. So Sadhu Guru Prasade, Taraye Ashwade. By the mercy of gurus and, and guru and sadhus, then they cause us to taste that sweet mixture of Gora Lila and Krishna Lila, and then we can say Jani Madhurya Prachur. We can know what is the real abundance, endless ocean of sweetness. So that is really the uh, supreme function of Guru Tattva to cause us to taste the sweet mixture of Gora Lila and Krishna Lila. That's the role of Guru in this. So that's necessary all the time. We should always have our guardians who are guiding us. And if Guru disappears in one form, he'll reappear in another form. Or we'll send an associate and gradually, gradually bring us. They all work together like a team. You know, in a football team, there's 11 players. But they're all trying to put the ball in the net. So in the same way, we like the ball. And our Diksha Guru and Shikshi Gurus, they're like a team. And one is passing to the other and... The goal, Kaloka Brindavan. Yeah. They yeah. engage us in the Kunja savor of Radha and Krishna. Yeah. Okay, so we can sing one kirtan? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm hmm. So everyone, no Balkapati, no, no, no Balkapati, Tandava Nitra, dance with the full energy. Thank you.